Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Green Forges interview series, where we speak with key experts and entrepreneurs across the CEA and sustainability world to, dis to explore themes through which to disrupt and improve these industries. I'm Ramon Pereira Bonilla, the Green Forges Community Manager, and today I am joined by our guest, Dan Cloutier. How are you doing today, Dan? Well, thank you very much for the invite and look forward to the chat. Awesome. It's great to have you here. And I'm also joined by Green Forges' very own Andrew Stride. Andrew is our Chief Product Officer. How are you doing today, Andrew? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. Awesome, awesome. So Dan, you are someone who has quite an extensive background and bio. Rather than me trying to list all of the different things you've been involved with, I'd love for you to maybe just highlight a few pieces that you think would be relevant for today's conversation. And then from there, uh, we can get into the nitty gritty. How does that sound? Great. Sounding or trying to be uh, brief, which is not always my strong suit. Um, I, I'm a Calgary born and um, raised guy. And, and um, having been so, it's hard to avoid the oil patch. And so um, after University of Calgary, ended up working in information technologies and primarily uh, over the years, uh, supply chain information technologies for, for the oil patch. That meant that we were often in, in regularly studying and looking at where are the reserves and what is the supply chain required to, to, to get at various reserves, et cetera. And I had worked in my first greenhouse when I was 14, so it was always a hobby and, and uh, of interest. But as I really studied supply chain, oil and gas, and how we do food production, and how important uh, oil and gas had become, not just for food production, but many, many other products, I really started to uh, think that uh, gee, we're going to have to do some things very differently and think, rethink some stuff. Uh, one of the uh, items that really struck me as uh, critically important was reading the um, comments from Norman Bulag in his uh, Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech for the Green Revolution, where he said something to the effect of the Green Revolution isn't possible without uh, natural gas uh derived nitrogen and um there's many that that will put forward in in the the peak energy uh uh perspectives that say well you know we better we better uh plan for that uh wisely and intelligent uh response and so i think that's very much um the the balance that that we've been seeking as uh we've sought out the the uh, collaborative partners that we have with Sprung Structures and in, in AgriHub, which we'll touch on a, in a little bit. Awesome, yeah. I um I'm excited to to dive into your work with AgriHub. I think something that stood out for me there is um you use the word intelligent and being intelligent about this transition. Um, that's something that's a, a theme that I feel like has come across in the conversations is um, folks almost just want to rush into things. Um, when we get to talk about localism for today and homesteading, I'm excited for you to, um, you know, I think we've painted a very pretty picture of these kind of things. And I think you're going to, in the nicest way possible, burst our bubble. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would love to hear about your work with um, AgriHub and ARC um, and, and those kind of things. Well, we're... Uh, really big believers in renewable uh, energies and, and permaculture approaches, etc. But as you say, often what we will hear, you know, some article somewhere or whatever will say, well, here's a magic bullet. And with this, everything is, is pristine and perfect and, you know, all worries behind us. But the more we look at things like electric vehicles and food production and in general, the supply chains around all this stuff, there's intelligent responses. They're not necessarily uh, easy. Um, some of it is going back to the to the future, right? Like uh, gardening and and in you know after after World War One and Two, they were called victory gardens, and it was about uh, getting back to uh, 
or or during those wars, I should say, it was about getting back to self-sufficiency. And the fact is, is with the treasure trove in the basement, as I call fossil fuels, what our ancestors knew was they were really dense energy-wise. And so we could do things that we never tried to do before, including saying, well, we won't grow uh, this or that. We can just have an international supply chain and ship it all over the place. And it works great until shipping costs get too high. We uh we know a thing or two about uh, high shipping costs, or I feel like the audience definitely does after the last two three years. Um, you know I I appreciate you know you use the word uh, self sufficiency I believe, um, and that leads us first into or greatly into our first topic, which is like I said localism and homesteading. Um, you know we we talked a lot about the need for localism because you know supply chains aren't as great as we thought they were. Um, the the global world is is maybe the globalized world is maybe not um, as as uh, solid as we thought it was going to be and so there's a, a real need for local people to find local solutions to their local problems but like I said I I want to hear your perspective on these things um, in particular um, you know what are some of the challenges that come along with like growing food at a non industrial scale and having like a direct business to consumer How's that? Perfect. Great. So I like this graphic a lot. Um, not to to villainize these big companies or anything, just to to speak uh, frankly of of things. So you know, when the, a lot of people when they're walking through the grocery store, they would have a sense that there's a whole lot of brands and a whole lot of uh, opportunity and variety and blah, blah, blah. And the fact of the matter is, is in the G20 countries, any grocery store that you walk through pretty much, there's 11 uh, companies that um, own and operate all of those brands and supply virtually everything that's in that store. And so by definition, they're multinationals, it's, it's mass manufacturing, it is very complex supply chains, and so there's, there's uh, good points about that, and there's bad points, there's pros and cons with, with everything. I touched on, on, you know, the transportation costs and, and folks uh, focus on that, so, you know, a local economy, of course, makes that uh, transportation uh, chain uh, very short and and that's got lots of um, advantages but it's like so many things it's much more complicated than that so when we when we look at uh, this study from 2015 all they point out is that when you look at how uh, energy is managed by mother nature if, food is is energy and essentially you can look at it in btus or calorific value or whatever what you'll almost universally see is that um you know the plants will consume energy or and and nutrients and photosynthesize it and and for one unit in maybe you get 1.4 units out or two uh units Two tends to be really on the higher end of efficiency. But what we're literally doing with our food system is that we're consuming 10.3 units of energy for every 1.4 that we're producing. There's nothing in Mother Nature that shows that being a sustainable model. And that's... Some would say the good thing that fossil fuels did for us. And then on the flip side, if fossil fuels are getting more expensive, and they are, or they're getting more scarce, and my strong conviction is from my decades in oil and gas is absolutely they are, then what you end up seeing is that, well, the intelligent response we need is to figure out how to get this back into a, a sustainable path. Mm. And a lot of people put forward, well, 
insulated, controlled environment agriculture systems uh, allows us to do that. But the fact is, um, and the results are really coming up, we didn't have to necessarily experiment with that, um, but somehow we insisted upon it. The, the, the Dutch in particular have looked at this six ways from Sunday, and they argued right from the get-go, you know, almost a decade ago, they said, that won't work, right? So this is an interesting graphic that a company put together, and they said, well, what if we can add uh, insulation at the right hours and times uh, for greenhouses? How much will we save? And it will surprise people to say, wow, I thought heating is the biggest uh, uh, cost. Some degree, yes. Um, but, you know, it's some savings in, in Quebec as an example. But for my uh, view for, as a business person, that's a long payback, 9.3 years. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So this analyst, AgriList, is, is, you know, we're pretty quick out of the gates and specialized in controlled environment agriculture. And what they've looked at uh, annually um, is to say who's profitable, what are they growing, and, and uh, what type of uh, systems. And so they argue that, you know, it's kind of 50-50 on the container farm front. Mm. I'm surprised by that number. I, I, uh, I'm not convinced that's correct. They said several years ago that 73% uh, of all vertical uh, controlled environment uh, farm operations were unprofitable. That is only accelerated in, in, in proven out. And so that, you know, uh, glass and poly greenhouses were it. And uh, most of the profitability happens to be in vertical vine crops. Hmm. Tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, some degree eggplant. It's kind of stuff we know, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So this is the big companies that raise the most money. And as you can see, you know, plenty uh, is funded by... Uh, Bezos and essentially uh, Google. Um, they've plowed through all of this capital. They're on on um, phase two uh, because of their backing. You know, they um, uh, have been able to raise another large amount of money and and are are doing uh, version two. Um, you can see some of these other guys have had some fairly large backing, but. Um, they haven't um, necessarily fared so well. That's not all of them. I'm not trying to talk disparagingly about controlled environment agriculture. I think that, and, and we'll get to some of that, energy is the number one issue that all of these guys have, have faced. Virtually all of them have said it. They don't necessarily still point to the right thing. They Some say, well, we would have been okay if the energy prices didn't surprise us with the high level of inflation. Yeah, but I would argue that that was entirely predictable and it ain't done yet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And and so um, basically, well, what where's all this energy cost? Well, um, the first thing that a lot of people would think is, well, it's lighting. And it's not. Lighting's a big deal on the on the capital uh, aspect, but the big big costs are particularly as soon as you're in an, an insulated building is how are you going to dehumidify it and how are you going to cool it because you're going to have lots of hours where you're overheating and and um, you can't dehumidify anything without air conditioning. Or, or cooling being in the mix. So AgriList did a good job of identifying this. I think this is two years old now. But basically what, what they showed is, well, um, if I'm in a insulated building, I'm going to have to run lighting year-round and at this, at this level. 
Whereas in the greenhouse, I'm going to run it quite a bit less. But in terms of, of uh, operating cost, because I'm going to be running pumps and air conditioning and dehumidification and, and, and lighting, I'm going to have an unbelievably higher uh, operating cost than the greenhouse. See, wow. the greenhouse yeah. is, is um, going to use an awful lot more of, of uh, sun energy and, and be able to take advantage easily of free cooling and, and those kinds of things. So a lot of people would look at it and say, well, um, if that was true, the closer I would get to the equator, such as as uh, UAE, then they would have the advantage. But they don't because their cooling costs are so very high. Mm. Whereas in in the Netherlands, um, you don't really have a bunch of cooling costs, but you have some heating costs, and you and you can take advantage of of uh, free ways to do that. And so you end up with, whether it's Sweden or Newfoundland or whatever, you end up with um, much, much uh, lower energy costs. Energy costs are always only second to labor, whether it's in a controlled environment, yep. agriculture setting, or a greenhouse. Yeah. So the next items I've touched on, you know, as this goes into more details, what are all those energy needs and systems that, that we would use? And, and then um, what, what does a mechanical engineer rather? Would he rather design a system, let's take two extremes, that is in a large greenhouse and lots of land and space around, etc.? So... I can put my air conditioner outside and when it's rejecting heat, which it will be doing, um, it's just not going to affect my, my inside environment. Or would I rather that it be uh, in an urban environment where I don't have much land and I, and I probably put it close by? Or in the worst extreme, I'm designing a food system for the International Space Station, so I need to make everything small. Hmm. I asked that question because it's pretty obvious. Which one's going to cost the most? Question for Andrew. <laughs> Space station for sure. <laughs> yeah. And even that urban one might not cost that much more, but it will cost some. This was how somebody uh, laid it out a, a little while back, and I, and I uh, – liked it very much. So from a CapEx standpoint, yeah, the LED lights are going to cost quite a bit and electrical costs um, for the lights and other things. Um, that, that'll be a big part in a controlled environment or opaque, opaque pardon me, uh, plant factory. Um, HVAC will be probably your third highest uh, capital cost um, after the, the, the building, of course, being the largest. But then, as I say, it's it's labor than than utilities, and you know, surprisingly, even the mortgage and rent are smaller uh, when when you think about it. So we put together this, not to say that it's all up to date and it's the right numbers or whatever. All we did is we we were showing capital cost versus black house or insulated or plant factory, whatever you want to call it. What is uh, at a eighth of an acre or a full acre? What's, what's the capital cost of, of uh, lights? And those are pretty accurate and hold true. Oops. Um, and then all in, what's the, what's the operating costs of a greenhouse? Um, in watt or kilowatts, as opposed to um, the the uh, controlled environment agriculture space, and you know the the Dutch um, had put forward studies on this years ago, and and really said it very conclusively. In fact, the one study I like best said uh, they believe it's it's eight times more to operate 
um, in in uh, the wrong energy environment. And you see, that's what I think Green Forge um, has a very unique opportunity on. Is it is you know a controlled environment agriculture space, and you will need the lighting, but you will have space uh, potentially uh, below below ground um, that is fairly low cost. You also have very, very consistent temperatures when you're at the right depths. And, and I'm sure Andrew could school me on, on why uh, that is such a game changer in the CEA space. We don't have enough, of enough field acreage. They have typically the uh, low cost for, for growing, but they have that big, big worry of, well, gee, um, what is our shipping or our supply chain costs going to be? Mm. Greenhouses can compete against that, right? Particularly because we can turn Newfoundland or the Arctic or uh, hot places into places we can almost grow anything as long as the energy cost is in, in line. Hmm. Um, because $7 a kilo uh, for lettuce is not typically uh, competitive to these other two things. And that's what the CEA folks uh, have learned and have been uh, struggling. Like I say, why did, why did um, greenhouses for so long go to tomatoes, cucumbers, and peppers? Well, they're vertical vines. They were already vertical growing. Mm -hmm. But you can produce such a huge poundage per square foot as compared to microgreens or lettuce. That's what the, you know, the, the real numbers uh, tell us. Yeah, I think there was a lot of uh, really cool, um, really useful dynamics that you brought forward. I'd love to just take a, a quick little break and hear Andrew's sort of reaction to this and maybe um, if you could talk to how we're thinking about some of these dynamics within Green Forges, because um, I think there's, there's a lot of cool things to discuss within that. Yeah, no, I Dan, I can't agree with you more. You make some some very valid points here. And uh, just looking at the, the picture you had up on the screen there, um, you're right they're they're getting these big crop yields per square footage out of these vine plants however um you know in vertical farming we have that ability to uh make those kind of you know densities profitable for the non-vine plants um so your lettuce your herbs um we can stack those on top of each other one after the other and uh, really get that density back um right our systems as a, as a whole, they're designed to be uh, crop dense. So for, you know, as you were saying, the, the acreage that we consume, we're really getting that high density out of it because we can place these systems very close to each other and we can go extremely deep. Um, we have recently, um, yeah, I'll point out to another good point you made about the energy inputs and how um, heating and cooling HVAC in general is, is massive. Um, you can't get away from the LED loads. They're making massive improvements with the efficiencies, but uh, ultimately they're static. Everyone's kind of on the same playing field when it comes to that stuff. Um, but the HVAC and the heat and cooling advantage, uh, we're really striving for that. Um, like you said, the stability of our system using that ground temperature as a, as a heat sink and then, um, kind of recapturing some of that heat in the, in the night cycles, uh, really helps stabilize those heating and cooling loads. And as you know, HVAC systems don't like to be ramped up, ramped down really quickly. Um, it's just not something they like to do, um, even at a, at a maintenance point of view, um, there's certainly challenges with going uh, so deep with uh, with an HVAC system. Um, we had a previously designed system that uh, worked well and worked off conventional wisdom, but uh, 
we actually have some, I'll say new developments coming down the engineering pipeline at the moment that I will keep within the team at the moment, but uh, I'll short to say that they will enable us to go much deeper than previously thought. So Nice. Well, that's that's what I've long been intrigued with with you guys is uh, particularly in my mind when you're using mining space, X mining space. Mm -hmm. There's an amazing amount of of that space, and then you know you're dealing with um, some some varieties because some mines are more humid than others. Uh, some are really hot depending where they're located, but there's an awful lot of them that just deal with this beautiful constant temperature, right? Mm -hmm. So I might uh, need to heat it up some to make it into conducive plant space. And I might need to cool it some. But the the extremes, I don't have to tell anybody, aren't there, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So whether it's, like you said, near the equator where they face those massive cooling loads or uh up north or very very far south where you know temperatures are getting that little bit colder especially up north like you know northern canada um you know going underground below even below permafrost in areas that have permafrost is uh is definitely one of our key advantages well um what i'd like to show you is this relentless um mast uh slide up yep it's up i think you yep, need yep, to great. click it one more time okay. so the second part comes on yep. so i haven't seen this updated from 1976 but the science council basically reported that only 13 percent of the land in canada is uh agricultural grade hmm. and only four percent of that is is uh, prime wow. that shocks people right and and we're one of the big landmass breadbasket uh folks of the world so you know if canada uh is at 13 percent you could easily go around country after country and say well what do they have right mm -hmm. and and it becomes uh very challenging when you're farming the land for any length of time, particularly with how we do it with fertilizers, you're mining the land. You're you're literally depleting uh, nutrients uh, year after year, right? So this isn't me saying this. This is this is uh, farmers and one of their key journals, which is the Farm Express, um, saying you know our our soils getting very very suspect. So when you're doing aquaponics and, and hydroponics like like uh, you are and, and we are, um, that offers some very different ways uh, to do things at the same time as, as going much more vertical. In a way, it's inventing land. So I love this graphic because um, what it's showing is uh, if you just plotted how much land do we use for uh, cow pasture and range? It shows you, well, that's that's what it would be if we plunked it all in the in the Midwest. And yeah, we we use some land for corn syrup, but that's that's the amount of it. But what it also highlights in the graphic, in my view, very very well, is it says, look, real estate's invaluable because they stopped making it, and it also shows you that. There's very little to spare, isn't there? Right? Hmm. It it's spoken for. It's being used. And so one of these things is is talking about the food versus fuel debate. And forever people said, well, we can't do that. We can't use more of this very exclusive in Canada 13% land to produce ethanol to put in our cars or biodiesel. And I don't know if you guys have, have seen the announcements, but um, the big players are currently announcing, well, indeed, we're gonna start using a 
huge amount more of this land for uh, growing corn and soy or what have you to make ethanol and biodiesel. Oh, I actually didn't know about that. No, I yeah, enormous, that. enormous quantities. And those are not only confirmed in, in my uh, understanding um, permitted plants, but they've been working for quite some time, very quietly in the background, securing the long-term uh, acreage of from from farm growers. So quite a lot of that is a done deal, right? Part of why I raise it is, as I say, we're we're eating uh, fossil fuels. We mm -hmm. need to be able to transport. We need to be able to cool those trucks. We need to be able to um, generate electricity to to run the the food coolers and and uh, all of that sort of supply chain. Well, why would I raise that in a, in a green forge setting? Well. Because what's underground is an opportunity at lower utility cost, but it's literally a creating acreage, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Tapping into unutilized space that uh, otherwise would just be, just be used for something else, uh, whether that's under a building or otherwise. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great opportunities there. And you see... In terms of what might we grow, one of the crops that I think is so horrendously overlooked uh, and, and uh, should be uh, uh, pursued uh, aggressively is algae. And why do I say that? Well, because here's what it looks like if you were to grow 50% of the U.S., um, fuel consumption as of 2008, which has gone up somewhat, with corn. You, you, you see how this says, well, this is what we would need. And you see how that just um, makes a big, ugly mess of this map beside us or, or on the left. Soybean would be, for many, the preferred crop for biodiesel makes not as bad a mess, but almost as much of a mess. LJ, we can grow on salt water. LJ, we can uh, use a, a lot of, of so-called polluted uh, waters, uh, particularly if we're going to use it to, it has many, many uses, but, but it can be used to make biodiesel. It can use to be, um, to to um, make pharmaceutical grade uh, uh, products, feed for uh, and, and protein for all kinds of uh, applications. It's it's just it's it's really a huge opportunity. You see, when you look at it, is um, with corn, I need twenty nine acres uh, per per uh, per gallon to make the a gallon, right? Gallon per acre, I'm trying to say. And then you go up, and if you're familiar with it, they're in, in Asia and, and a number of places that are hot enough to grow palm, a lot of people are like, oh, there you go, that's 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 fantastic. And so they destroyed an enormous amount of, of prime uh, forestry acreage, in part the lungs of the world, right? Um, LJ, when we talk about the, the, uh, treasure trove in the basement, most would argue that a tremendous amount of the natural gas and oil actually has always been derived from LJ. So we're not, hmm. we're not, um, reinventing the wheel. It's a very natural wheel. It tends to be on a large, long, uh, timeline, but Look at that difference, right? Nothing else comes close. 10,000 gallons per acre or 200,000 gallons per acre. Well, it's it allows us to do things vertically and can be a, a, an intelligent response and, and, a, and a game changer. 
and we can we can do it in a very uh, decentralized uh, fashion. And I I submit that um, the the profitability of that um, is beyond what tomatoes and cucumbers is. Uh, yeah, so Dan, I I really love that you brought up the point of of algae, and you make some some very compelling points here. Um, the reason I love it so much that you brought it up is it's something that uh, is definitely in the Green Forges roadmap for the future. Uh, like Ramon said, we really want to nail down our first product line of the plant forges, but um, the algae forges are in the roadmap, and uh, we're it's a project we're really really excited to pursue um, and it really ties into one of our company goals of uh, restoring the the surface to uh, natural states right as you point out we use so much incredible acreage for all these crops which could be condensed and uh, derived from algae in a really dense location and then that can kind of relieve some of this space on the surface that we can kind of restore back to its natural state. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, getting to how to leverage that into a, a larger uh, circular economy, this is this is the slide that um, we use at, at AgriHub for the product offering and, and intelligent response that, that we've, uh, we do offer and, and uh, doing some installs around, but we, you know, we, we have quite a bit of development going on. So for us, we have been building uh, farms as AgriHub since 1957 and um that that's our tagline. We we build farms, and it's and it's been always predominantly um, livestock uh, focused. And what we're trying to do with the sustainable regenerative stuff is to say, the things that are buzzwords today, the trends. Hopefully, lots of those will be truly sustainable in long term, and not just flash in the pan stuff hopefully we'll think it through well enough that we won't uh, just uh, repeat uh, errors like some of the CEA stuff uh, did. And and one of the ways to um, protect against that is just using good old-fashioned good business principles and capitalism. And so for us, one of the things that we uh, openly say to people if if it's regenerative and sustainable but doesn't have a five year simple payback, we're not interested. If it's just well, this is the right thing to do, and the, you know um, we're pushed there because of of purely PR stuff, and it just increases costs, and and it hurts uh, profitability in the bottom line, that might stay in place for a very long time. But it's always at risk, much more at risk than if it's a five-year simple payback. So how do we see some of that coming together? Well, you know, when you look at the fact that the grains are 50% of our calorific value, and there are some people that say, yeah, we're going to do that vertically too, and that might be the case. I have a feeling that, at least for quite a long time, most of the grain crops are 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 going to be out uh, in the fields, just like the canola or camelina is is in the the fields for providing us essentially lipids, which will allow us to make biodiesel. So that's why we would put LJ there. But if we're trying to run our farm uh, for particularly the wheats and so forth. Without tractors, we're going back to a time before uh, Henry Ford in, in the tractor, and that doesn't sound like it's going to be a, a, an easy transition uh, no, by any lie. stretch of the imagination. Absolutely. 
So an interesting thing is with with whether it's crushing canola seed or algae, what we end up with is meal that is very valuable for feed. And and um, you know the most expensive feed is protein based, and and whether it's uh, canola, camelina, algae, they all provide meal that is rich in in protein, uh, not unlike say barley. So so our our uh, circular economy is is starting to rotate in in that way. Um, you know, I, I touched on, on mining soils and depletion, etc. Well, ruminants and manures and, um, uh, uh, hay and, and such are really, really, uh, valuable and important, um, organic materials to keep the microorganisms that keep our soils healthy, alive and well. There's a tremendous amount of what we call soil that it has very little to no microbiology left in it and that uh, doesn't e exist in in natural lands and it can't exist in our stomachs if we don't have those microbes we don't digest things and it can't exist in uh, um, in highly healthy soils which we need healthy mediums aquaponic water or soils to be able to produce healthy foods. Otherwise, we're eating a pepper or a lettuce, a head of lettuce that looks like a pepper or a head of lettuce, but it just doesn't have the nutrients. And by taking um, that circular economy and ending up uh, running these things through what's called anaerobic digesters so that we can produce biogas, which is virtually exactly identical to uh, natural gas. And how are we doing it? We're creating the uh, conditions of, of swamps, right? So we're, we're not doing something very new. Mother Nature uh, had been doing it for a couple of weeks now. But now we end up with this, with this great uh, renewable uh, fertilizer. And with the algae, uh, what we end up with is we can actually be taking uh, these uh, waste streams from even human wastewater treatment plants and, and turning that into biodiesel if we so uh, choose or turning some of it into uh, biogas, which we can run things like cogeneration or quadgeneration. We can run it on natural gas, biogas, biodiesel or petrodiesel and we, we we can actually have flex fuel systems that are essentially providing the electricity and and even the heating and cooling and the co2 that is required for a, for a green forge which might exist um right on a on a farm and it might exist on a on a cattle feedlot as an example particularly if it has a mine underneath it. So that's why we're having the discussions we've been long having with, with Green Forge. And this is the work uh, we're doing with, with uh, AgriHub. And some would say, well, what on earth would you do with a sprung structure in a, in a mine or over top of Green Forge? Well, it's airtight. It's, it's uh, extremely efficient systems for us to be able to manage th th our energy requirements and manage uh, temperatures. Yeah, th thanks for this, Dan. I think um, it, it sounds a little cheesy, but it's it's almost kind of beautiful, uh, like transforming the economy from being this very extractive uh, thing where, you know, for a while, uh, economists and a lot of them today still operate on the assumption that just infinite growth, infinite capital, um, without the realization that we are on a limited earth um, and we have limited resources. Absolutely. And so it's, it's deeply Absolutely. important that we look at ways to um, take the valuable resources which we extract and even things that we would consider to be waste and recycle them. So with that in mind, Andrew, I'd love to ask you um, 
how is Green Forges thinking about this principle of like the circular economy? And is there any maybe particular ways in which we're trying to uh, um, recycle some of the things that uh, we produce that would be otherwise considered waste? Absolutely. So um, really trying to, to shorten the cycles as much as we can um, and a number of cycles there. Um, really on the resources input side, we're trying to do that as much as possible. So for example, on water, uh, we recycle uh, near 100% of the water that enters the system. Um, and oh, the same goes with heat. So uh, the heat during the day, some of it gets absorbed within the soil, uh, which we end up recapturing during the night cycle. Um, and then what we don't get to recycle, we end up, um, if paired with a building or uh, residential or wherever, we will tie that waste heat into the building HVAC system to kind of heat homes or potentially even cool them, uh, though that might be site specific um, for cooling. Um, Geez, yeah, I don't really know where else you want me to go with that one. Sorry to break no, up. That, <laughs> no, no, that was that was <laughs> perfect. Had going there. I'll, I'll cut it. Uh, I'll cut it like ten seconds. <laughs> uh, that's perfect. That's perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. Um, thanks for that, Andrew. I I, I want to end this with asking each of you one question, um, and then we can we can hit the road and enjoy our weekend. Um, so Dan, based on today's conversation, this is a bit of a loaded question, but you know if if you could. Um, get into the minds of a very important person in CEA, what is one thing, like one mindset shift that you would want to, to leave them with? Um, take your time. I know that was, that was a bit loaded. <laughs> well, I, I get lots of concepts from, from, you know, great minds that, that uh, are beyond me. And, and uh, the fellow that wrote the book, um, Schumacher, I believe is how you pronounce his last name, is called Small is Beautiful. And he wrote that in the 70s. It, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm a very, very avid reader, extensive reader, and that's just one of the strongest uh, books. So, you know, we entered into, because of fossil fuels, like I, I asked people, do you, do you think we could have done the industrial revolution without fossil fuels. And, and mostly people think about it and they go, no, I don't think so. How, how could you have done it? Right. Um, and, and so we entered into, as Schumacher called it, the age of the big, everything was mass and that's the way we do it. And, and what we want to do is become the biggest monopoly possible. And of course, you know, from a capitalist standpoint, that's admirable and I, and I won't criticize it. Right. Um, but it's not necessarily the most efficient. And there has been examples for a long time. There was a mindset that said, IBM said, it's all going to be massive mainframes. That's it. Right. But. We've had the the internet revolution where we figured out, hey, we can be uh, really big companies and small companies um, and do very, very well in a decentralized model. And there's a tremendous amount of high quality lifestyle and, and uh, profit that can uh, be had hand in hand. So, so when we're thinking about how do we redo our food system, and we have to, we don't have a choice, and our energy system, and I argue we have to, we don't have a choice. And I, and I don't argue it from a climate change standpoint. I'll just leave that whole debate aside. I'll just say every other reason you want to come up with. Right? <laughs> and and the, the, the fact is, is I don't know that you can do it in massive central thinking. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Local local solutions to local problems is I think uh, gonna be the, 
a huge theme of the century. Um, well, there's there's really big companies that provide infrastructure for local that they don't restrict the freedom of the local and the capitalism of the local and so forth. And then there's what I'll call the evil empires that put the screws into all of that. Yeah. And that's, that's the biggest enemy. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very well said. Um, I appreciate you leaving us with that. Andrew, your question. Um, what are you most excited for in, in Green Forge's future? I think you probably have uh the, the the deepest look under the hood what what are you uh what are you excited for uh, there's a, there's a lot to be excited for um i think uh my my short term excitement the big goal is uh is getting that pilot set up proving to the world that um you know we're not full of it our systems work um and uh, and we're really onto something here um and then long term, really just looking forward to seeing how these systems can benefit communities and how they can kind of help local economies and, and help all the, you know, I, I won't say solve because these are such big problems that there's no yeah. one magic bullet, but yeah. uh, help on improving on all these issues we spoke about today. Uh, that's That's what gets me excited and what keeps me going. Andrew, you got my, you got my heart feeling all warm. <laughs> um, well, well, thank you both so much for sitting down with me. It has been an absolute pleasure. I, I really hope um, that the audience gets a lot out of this as much as I did, because it, it was definitely um, a, a big learning experience. So thank you both so much for being here and, and thank you to the audience for tuning in. Uh, catch you on the next one. Take care guys. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much.